Would you go back in time to learn how to speak whale if it meant saving the future? Well, guys, good news. That's what we're talking about today, <laughs> of all things. Guys, we're discussing Star Trek. Uh, it's not episode. It's just the fourth movie, Star Trek Four: The Voyage Home. Um, guys, I, I'm excited for this one. This is actually one of my favorite favorites uh, growing up it's a movie that I'm, I'm really attached to and it's a topic that you guys have heard me ramble on a lot as this is our special for earth day we're doing this to celebrate earth day and to think deeper about our own um roles as christians and humans in the world and what role we should be playing when it concerns caring for the earth and i couldn't do this alone i'm joshua noel uh i'm just a guy but i'm here with some incredible individuals um we have the, the the leading expert Vulcan on humanity, the one and only Christian Ashley. How's it going, Christian? Uh, live long and prosper, my friend. Good, 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 good. Peace and long life. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I am also here with the one and only uh, Reverend Justin Coleman. How's it going, Justin? Going very well. He's, He's 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 just a human captain. He he's a human. But for some for some Klingon action, we want the leader of, of the Klingons. Um, you know, post yeah, some Reformation maybe. Uh, the one and only Matthew Winter. How's it going, Matt? <laughs> I'll take. I don't that. know if I'll I want to go to Klingon Reformation. <laughs> That'd be. Uh... I... Yeah, I it could would be out. something. Yeah, the, uh, reimagining Martin Luther as a Klingon and like oh, I got all kind of convergences here. This is great. I yeah, can pull that off. The ninety-five theses turn into the ninety-five massacres. <laughs> ninety-five massacres. Oh God, this is already getting off the rail. <laughs> you know, bat left fits grin. It's gonna be great. Yeah, if you guys didn't know that you needed to kick off your Earth Day with some massacre talk, well, you're welcome. That's what we're here for <laughs> to remind you what it's all about. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, hey, before I ask you guys what we're geeking out, I want to ask everybody if you are on YouTube to smash that like and subscribe button. If you're on the podcast, if you're on Apple podcast, uh, some, you know, smash. What was it rate and review? Yeah, rate and review. Spotify is yeah. where you do the five stars. And you got to hit that little bell. And if you're on a laptop, I need you to go over to Podchaser. Leave us a rate and review over there because that really helps the algorithm and other people on computer see who the heck we are. And we would like for them to know who the heck we are. Of course, we want to thank one of our supporters. You know, we shout out a Patreon Captivate or Apple Podcast subscriptor every, epi every episode. And this time, uh, it's, a, it's a friend of ours, Trip Fuller. I want to give you a shout out. Thank you for sponsoring the show, man. You rock. And now let's um let's go let's go backwards for this one. Let's start with I say backwards. Oh yeah, hey, this isn't like Zencaster. This is Streamyard. This isn't a plug. This is just me remembering that everyone sees the same screen that I see. So when I say backwards, everyone actually can know what I'm talking about. Instead of it just being random for each person, um, Matthew. Yeah. What what you been geeking out on lately, man? Mm. Uh, been geeking out. I started a new, uh, new small group, um, at church. It's like a part two of something I've done before. This is but but this this is the pilot. I've never done the part two of this. So, um. Authors Pete Scazzaro, the uh, the material is uh, emotionally healthy discipleship. So part one we did in the fall, which I had done before. That's emotionally mm -hmm. healthy spirituality. Um, that's kind of cultivating the up relationship just through finding stillness and learning to be before you do and all of those sorts of things. Um, and then part two, which we've never done before, is emotionally healthy relationships. So that's that's more of incarnational listening, um, learning to see each other as we truly are rather than our projected yeah. expectations um and and just how um how gifting and the spirit and all that stuff flows in and out of all that so um just kind of geeking out on that right now i'm um, getting into that material reading just a bunch of other books that kind of uh coincide with that so um just kind of geeking out yeah some more, some uh, geeking out on some zesty lately. practical theology yeah exactly yeah yeah i like it i like it nice stuff all right, Justin, let us know what you've been geeking out on lately, man. Well, I'd like to lift up a couple things. One, um, I was at a, um, 
a lecture um, not too long ago, ago by uh, Rabbi Shai Held, who wrote a book titled Judaism is About Love. Uh, a great look at love through the eyes of the Jewish community um, in conversation with Christian uh, theologians as well, but just a, a, a wonderful book. So geeking out about that. And I'm geeking out about X Men '97. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A lot of people are on that the X Men kick these days. I've never been a big X Men fan. Um, it's I, if y'all didn't know, I'm known as Josh with long opinions, and that's just that's probably the top of the list for a lot of people. Christian, <laughs> what you been Keith, geeking out about lately, man? <laughs> uh, yeah, more uh, than one. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was being generous. Uh, so, <laughs> as opposed to my theologian friends here, uh, I watched the. <laughs> Uh, I need needed some more hammer horror in my life, and I start I'm starting to watch some of those I've never seen before. So I went to Dracula eight excuse me, Dracula eighty nineteen seventy two. So if you want to learn how to bring back you know Count Dracula from the dead, you can perform satanic rites in the church, and that can happen. So it's it's a documentary. It's pretty good. You know I'm, I'm gonna get yeah. Well, I'm gonna get real <laughs> real nerdy with everybody right now because I was just gonna be Fantastic. like yo Fallout. I was just gonna be like yo it's Fallout. I love that series. It's great. Mm. Instead, let me tell you what I actually spent an, an embarrassing portion of my day doing. I had realized <laughs> how excellent the Indiana Jones and the Great Circle looks that's coming out on Xbox and all of the Xbox related things like Game Pass and all that. I don't have an Xbox, never been an Xbox guy. I don't want to go spend $500 on a system so I can play one game. That just seems dumb. So what did I do instead? I spent the entire day trying to figure out the cheapest option of what I can get <laughs> allow me to play that. Because I'm like, technically, I can do it on the phone because it's going to be on Game Pass. So I could do that, but it's going to be really wonky. So I was looking at different controllers and stuff I could plug into my phone that would make it a little bit better. I was looking into, I know TJ, shout out to the guy who listens to every episode. He doesn't listen to any episodes, but he... <laughs> nope. Listen, I know he's starting a business where he's building his own computer. So I was looking into that, like how much would it cost to just get a computer built that only has one function. It only needs to play one game. That's it. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I stumbled onto the Xbox Series S, which is like the like one of the newest Xbox stuff that only plays digital games. I'm like, you know, mm -hmm. that might be the route. It's only like, okay, it's still an embarrassing amount of money to spend for one game. Like, it's like 160 if I get it used. But I'm like, man, think about how much I spent on Kingdom Hearts 3. I bought a new TV for that. Uh, I'm just purge a little bit for Indiana Jones. <laughs> And it's less, way less than if you built a computer. Yeah, it is. It is way less than that. I have decided it's only logical. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So with that, we could jump into our Earth Day special, uh, the spectacular we're about to get into. Um, before anything else, this is Star Trek Four. A lot of the Star Treks, they're not like Star Wars movies. They don't directly build off each other a lot of the time. This one does. Like You can tell where it fits in the other Star Trek movies. I don't think you have to watch it, though. Like, I feel like you could just watch this on its own. But still, Reverend Justin, could you give us a little background? What's going on in the Star Trek world? Who are these characters we need to know before we start the movie? All right. Wow. So this is the original series uh, cast. Um, this is a group that uh, begins the Star Trek tradition of found family. Um and with the primary uh, three characters being uh, Captain Kirk, uh, well, Admiral Kirk, excuse me, uh, Captain Spock, um, and uh, Dr. Uh, McCoy, who we call Bones. Well, this, um, this movie begins picking up from the last where uh, Spock, speaking of uh, resurrections of the non-vampiric kind, where Spock uh, had died and uh, through uh, a process of uh, scientific recreation using a Genesis device, he's alive again and his soul is placed back into his body. So the movie begins with uh, Spock being a bit disoriented uh, related to this family that he's been a part of. But also there's this d disorientation across the part of space they're in because this, this alien entity has come and disrupted all communication and technology around whatever it passes as it is probing different planets and, uh, and, and cultures 
for a language that they don't seem to have in this century. So that's what's going on here at the beginning of Star Trek Four. Am I getting into the movie? Am I doing the movie summary? Hey, you're uh, you're muted there, buddy. Thank you. No, that was perfect. That was perfect. It's a perfect setup for Matthew Winter to to jump in and let us know what happens in Star Trek to the Voyage Home. What's your elevator version? Like if you just had to give us like or the quickest summary you could of what quickest summary here. of Star Trek four. Yeah. So um, this probe from somewhere far deep in outer space comes just drains the power of everything as it comes in. <laughs> And it is evaporating Earth's oceans. There is just this calamitous end of the world apocalyptic thing happening mm. because of this probe. Come to find out, they are there to talk to whales. And because humanity sucks, we've killed them all. So <laughs> Kirk, Kirk and crew must go back in time to bring whales to the future so we don't die. <laughs> I love it. I love it, especially because like a, a good movie summary, if you're doing it quick enough, makes the movie seem even more ridiculous than it is, which is hard to do for this film. <laughs> like the more you think about it, the most ridiculous premise ever. Oh, yeah, it is. Like I, I, the meat of this movie is great. Uh, the moment they go back in time up until they go back to like everything that happened in 23rd century, the beginning and end stupid. Like it makes no <laughs> sense. It's cheesy. It's not good. But that middle when they're on Earth, that's some fun stuff. That's where the laughs happen. <laughs> oh man um well does anybody else have any like quick like what what's your feelings uh thoughts just initially about the film you just want to tell us how much you love it before we get into the deeper stuff or are you all ready to just jump into the deeper stuff love or it tell as us a kid. how much you hate it that would be fun uh, <laughs> right, go ahead love, love it as a kid obviously just because it's such a fun just a ridiculous movie um, you know, the music is fun, like all the action and, and the comedy um, and all that's hilarious. And just. Can we talk about Spock trying to swear? <laughs> I mean, Use colorful that is, metaphors. Colorful yeah. metaphors. <laughs> I mean, These are you not know, hell, your whales. <laughs> <laughs> not the hell, your whales. Yeah, I Spock trying to swear. And then I think the. Um, the doctor with his 23rd century medicine running through the hospital or probably, well, that and then yeah. the, the Russian scene, the Russian looking for nuclear secrets. Those are my three favorite. Like, they're so funny, especially you understand, like, the context this movie happened in. Hilarious. And that's what's so fun about this movie, because so I mentioned before that, you know, Star Trek is about found family when you think about these crews. But there are in the in the core of the movie, there are multiple storylines going on at the same time because mm -hmm. this core bridge crew has been split up into different missions, which allows um, moments for each of them to shine. Uh, that's part of what I love about this movie. You don't really mm -hmm. have anyone that's too muted or think, wait, were they even in this movie? I mean, they they all got a moment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I love Bones, Spock, Kirk, um, e even Scotty, like like all of their parts in this are like they're fun, too. Like it's not it's not like the most dramatic Star Wars movie, Star Trek movie or anything like that. Like you're not leaving this like with some sense of gravitude or I, I don't even really feel like if you're not trying to do like what we do, I don't even think you're leaving thinking that much. You're just like, ah, that was fun, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. But that being said. Christian Ashley was the one who initially suggested we review this movie for Earth Day. Ah. So, Christian, wh why does this have to, what is this, I mean, obviously I know, but do you want to, like, fill us in why you think this is relevant for Earth Day? <laughs> well, Joshua, if we don't take care of the planet, 300 years in the future, a probe is going to head towards us, <laughs> trying to contact the things that we exterminated. So, oh, prevent that from happening, as the, Aesop, the space whale Aesop of this film states, we need to take care of the Earth. So that when this does happen later on, there is no issue. <laughs> but the serious answer being like, this is a one of the few times I can ever think of in film history where an environmentalist message has been brought into a film and it's not beating you over the head with it. It this is it is brought up and said, Yeah, this is serious, something we need to look at, but it's done in a fun way. 
it's done where I don't feel guilty for anything that I haven't done. Like this is this is something we can do. We can fight towards, and that's why at this stage in history, we don't have as many countries out there wailing anymore like we used to. Not to say that this film caused all that, but it, it definitely inspired other people to go into uh, more environmental standards and you know protect the earth in other ways, shape and form. That's the importance is. Hey, these things that are around here, they're not always going to be here. So let's do what mm -hmm. we can now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think this movie does a really good job of like pairing stuff down to be way more simple than it is. And I say good, like that, that might sound like a negative, but I really do believe that's a good thing because I think sometimes it's hard to see the big picture because there's so many different variables and so much nuance in real life. And sometimes we need to just see if we don't do this, this will happen. <laughs> you know, like sometimes we need to be able to see that almost in black and white. And I think that's a positive that this film actually creates for us. Um, oh, man, there's there's so much to say. I actually do really enjoy this film. Um, and, and one thing you were getting at that I wanted to bring up, it feels a lot like how I interpret apocalyptic literature, right? Like back in ancient Bible times, when they wrote apocalyptic literature, they usually were not trying to tell you what the future is. Usually what they were trying to do is show you a picture of what the future would be because of what we're doing now, the message is usually for now, not for us to figure out exactly what's going to happen in the future, but rather mm -hmm. for Agreed. us to decipher what's going to happen in our time right now and what should I do about this? And I think that's the kind of message this movie tells. No, it's not an apocalyptic movie, but it does kind of do the same, fulfill the same purpose as some of our apocalyptic literature uh, in the Bible and outside the Bible in ancient Near Eastern times. Matt looks like he's bursting at the seams. Mm. No, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> I didn't know if you had more to add. Okay. No, it's good, well, man. If, uh, if we're good then, let's let's talk a little bit more about the film itself. Um, I do I do just really enjoy this. For, from the moment they all get into Las Vegas, and it's it feels a lot more like New York than Vegas, to be fair. Um, but it's fun. It's just fun San watching Francisco. them go around, having, yeah, San Francisco, thank you, having no idea like what to do in our time that they still not used to the idea of like needing money for stuff. Um, <laughs> Spock tying to thin around his ears. So he doesn't stand out like all of it's so much fun. Um, let's talk about just like the idea of the voyage. So from the, from the point of them deciding together, they want to go face the consequences for what they did in movie three all the way to the end, there's this story of them going back to the future. So if you didn't know, this is a crossover between back to the future and star Trek. Um, mm. That's, that's not true, <laughs> but it did come out like a year after the second Back to the Future, I think, something like that. Yes, it happened around the same time. Um, but what are what are our initial thoughts on just kind of the idea of the journey itself? Like, I, I feel like they just wanted to do time travel, so we're doing time travel. But maybe you guys have better thoughts than me here. Something it's a little bit some more deep insight. Do y'all have any thoughts on this? Well, time travel has always been a huge part of Star Trek in the background. Uh, and this is before we get into the other series, like next generation doesn't come out until three years after this. Was it 87 or 89? It's 87. Yeah. Mm. 87. Okay. So it's a year after this. Right. So we don't have the things that'll happen in those media, but in the original series, they travel back in time two, three times, times already. So mm -hmm. that, that's, we get some nice callbacks there and that, Hey, Spock has to hide his ears again. You know, they got to deal with the concept of money once more. So it's not that they're completely foreign to them, but they're having to relearn what they unlearned because it came to a future, this future that will never exist in our lifetime where money doesn't happen, doesn't exist anymore. And everyone just gets along because we say so. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's kind of fun, though, because this it's very antithetical to a lot of Star Trek's message. So a lot of the other stuff that Star Trek does is here's this idealistic version of the future. So it's almost the opposite of that apocalyptic idea of, hey, this is what could be if we all did things better. <laughs> but for this movie, they kind of take a sidestep and they're like, OK, but some ways it will be worse if we're doing what we're doing now. So it's like a little bit different than the message Star Trek usually gives us. I, I find it interesting that all the crew did decide to go back and face consequences. I liked that. I feel like the, the nerd in me is like, this could have been that first episode of Star Trek where they just did all like legal stuff. You know, that uh, the one from Next Gen everyone talks about, which have a giant court case. That could have been fun for me, but probably would have made it for a terrible movie. So so they went a different direction. Be a good um, episode of a show, be a bad movie. Yes. <laughs> Correct. 
Um, so the, the other part of the voyage is uh, they have a, their part of their engine gets burnt out when they go do the time travel thing, and they have to find a way to recreate the energy they need. So they do a lot of like they don't get deep into it, but they talk some about nuclear energy, what humanity was doing at that time, and how they could use it for their own benefit. Um, so I did want to not ignore the nuclear energy part of this conversation because it does seem to be something they wanted us to think about as well. Hmm. Um, Reverend Justin, you have any thoughts on like how they commented on nuclear energy or just your own thoughts on nuclear energy, anything like that? Well, yeah, so just a couple things here. So this is a time when, <clears throat> you know, thinking about uh, sustainability and uh, forms of uh, generating uh, power you know, uh, nuclear energy was one where it's like, all right, so we've got, it's doing some cool stuff, but it's also dangerous. And there's a lot of tension around that. And how we, how do we do that? Well, how can we, um, you know, in the midst of uh, this uh, nuclear arms race, we're talking about, you know, backing that down. There's all those conversations going on about the threat that nuclear power can have um, in our world. It's also, I don't know what the proximity of this is to Superman 4, but there's, they, <laughs> you, I know, I'm, I'm sorry to make you think about it, but, <laughs> but that's also, they had like all this nuclear commentary yeah, there, right? Yeah. So this is a thing that's going on uh, here in, in movies. Mm -hmm. And the, just the, the whole idea that without this power, they would have been stuck and could not save the future without nuclear power. You cannot save the future because in the movie that uh, energy is going to help to reconstitute recharge essentially yeah. the dilithium crystals on the, on the Klingon ship. So it's, it's necessary uh, to save uh, the future if it's harnessed mm -hmm. and used toward a common good. And I sure. think, that is what they were trying to say uh, in this yeah. movie. I, I think this is one of those parts of the film that probably aged way better than the rest, and it's because mm. they played it safe here. Um, so a lot of your media at the time, yeah. and especially you being a big Captain Planet fan, and that was actually, I think that's what we did for Earth Day <laughs> last year, was Captain Planet. Um, yeah. that, nice. Captain Planet was coming out around the same time, yeah. and you have bad guys that are just straight up nuclear energy, the bad guy, and it's aged terribly. Because now, as opposed to the 80s, we think of nuclear energy, we actually realize that in a lot of ways, it's much cleaner energy yeah. than a lot of the other stuff if we do it correctly. So yeah. what's interesting is this film is they still show how at that time it's producing all this terrible byproduct, mm -hmm. but then they show how the 23rd century scientists are able to use that byproduct and create clean energy. And I think it was more just a commentary of it was necessary that turned into as we've aged and we realized that the science of the time was wrong, which, hey... For those who don't know, that's what scientists do. They just constantly try to disprove themselves. It's not a thing against science to say they were wrong. That's what they try to do. They're constantly yep. trying to disprove themselves. That science at the time was wrong. So now we're looking at this in our own time going, oh, yeah, that actually would just be the cleaner energy. And I think it's actually aged really well compared to some of the other jokes in the film about Russians trying to get our nuclear secrets and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, I'm a, I'm, I'm pro thorium, and if you follow yes. this stuff, at, um, if you follow this stuff at all, actually, we're not too far out from fusion, because we've mm. got, we've, we've got some fusion happening in Japan. Mm -hmm. Um, we're at net gains right now. Like it takes as much energy to create fusion as fusion creates, but it'll get better. Um, and then when that happens. Um, anyway, so that's <laughs> two. Um, yeah, they still they use fusion in Star Trek. I mean, we we, we mm -hmm. think of the uh, we think of the anti matter matter uh, reactor or whatever, but they use fusion reactors to create the spark mm. for the warp core. So they're they're using nuke in the future. So they figured out how to do all that mm -hmm. cleanly. And uh, yeah, they're just using the radiation to recrystallize the lithium matrix and all that so they don't get stuck in the past. Oh, yeah. 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 So it's just it's interesting how a, a necessary evil 
kind of message mm-hmm. turned into a, no, this is actually just the right kind of energy to use. And yeah. I think Star Trek even called out and said that in the 21st century, we were going to figure out fusion. And um, well, here we are. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think um, it's super important too. Remembering when this film is created in 1986, what happened earlier that year, Chernobyl, yeah. and then five years before that was the Three Mile Island incident. Mm-hmm. And in the eyes of the public, nuclear energy was the boogeyman. It was no, this is evil, and you had all these people rallying against it. Now, not unreasonably so, in that hey, these events happen, we shouldn't be allowing them to happen. But to the point of extremism. Uh, legalism in that regard of well we should never have any part of it and this gives a positive message for it within reason of saying hey we don't get it now but if we keep studying it this is where we're going to end up Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's that's one thing i think the faith community can learn really well from the science community and uh that that whole thing of always trying to disprove yourself and rather celebrating the times that you figured out you were wrong rather than yeah. we have this like this thing in like my the Christian circles I'm around anyway, where it's almost like we're like, oh, we were wrong about that. And it's like, we don't talk about it anymore. Like we're scared to talk about it because we were wrong about it once. And it's like almost like shame. Whereas the science community like celebrates the times they were wrong. And I'm like, we, I think we might be able to do this better. <laughs> yeah. Justin, you have any, you have any thoughts? It looks like you're thinking. No, I mean, I just think it, it must have been, <clears throat> Given all the context that you know we've just shared, it must have been a fairly edgy uh, commentary at the time. Like, whoa, okay, so they're gonna uh, that's the take <laughs> yeah. on it, right? Um, and uh, and so it had it had some teeth mm-hmm. there, and and I and again, like you say, it's not you know overplayed in any kind of way, but it 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 was it had a though. It, though we might say subtle, it had some teeth at the time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. For sure. And I, I didn't want to spend too much time on it because it's not the main crux of the movie, but I, I do think it's something they wanted us to think about and talk about. And uh, I wanted to give it due diligence before we talked about the important stuff, you know, whales, whales are the important <laughs> part of this. film. <laughs> so let's get that real big on YouTube for everybody. This is a whale with a, with a <laughs> Vulcan. <laughs> <laughs> mind melting him in his underwear for some reason. I, why did he? He only took his pants off. Nothing else. Just his pants. Well, he was <laughs> shirt he was fine, wearing, but pants. Wearing, nah, that's gotta he was go. Wearing the robe thing, so we don't even oh, that, know if he had. We don't even know that's if he true. had we, pants. Were, were the robe was the robe <laughs> his pants as well? I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is the big question they really want us to be asking. What was, was Spock Spock's pants? attire? <laughs> was he wearing pants before this instance or not? <laughs> One of the great mysteries of Star Trek. Uh, what happened? <laughs> Whales. So, because <laughs> I, I can't be serious right now. I don't, I'm, I'm struggling. Um, Christian, talk to us about whales. I don't have a good question. Just whales. Go. <laughs> <laughs> whales. Whales are one of those species that you like, you first hear about it and go, these massive creatures that's just like, swim in the ocean they're they're things they're just not like made up for movies or tv i I remember the first time it was a killer whale but still a whale nonetheless uh was when i went to sea world and saw one for the first time and i know we're going to be talking a little bit about killer whales are actually dolphins oh that's right they're not whales (laughs) okay yeah that is oh yeah i am completely wrong thank you for correcting me fascinating though (laughs) but they're also they're also not killers they're just (laughs) yes friendly whales and then seeing like oh that's just a small one now i've never actually had the opportunity that i can recall of actually seeing a whale out in the wild but from watching nature documentaries and stuff like that and seeing oh these majestic creatures have been here for quite some time and they're so loving and gentle and they'll even be friendly with divers that come up next to them it's like why would anyone want to hurt these well then you learn later on there are very useful products that can be made uh, from utilizing whales. You have ambergris, you have oil, you have the meat, you have the blubber, you have all these things that, well, no wonder there was a huge part of American history and uh, the rest of the world, too, where we were sending fleets to kill these poor innocent creatures to get what they had to the point where we went too far. And that's where we get to the point of right now where, no, we can't be doing this because we need a stable population. If we had a stable population, I wouldn't have an issue with it. 
but the thing is we don't and that's not going to happen because they have such a low birth rate and a very long uh, gestation period if i remember remember not remember correctly that it's just not sustainable to be hunting them right now yeah and th- th- yeah yeah th- see we get in a tr- tricky conversation when we're talking about hunting in general and this can be a little bit of a side step but it's fine because, yeah, there, there is a sense of, like, if we don't hunt the deer population, they overpopulate and even become a danger to themselves. So it's like it, people don't really bat an eye when you talk about hunting deer. But when you talk about hunting whales, even people who just don't have all the context and the morals and ethics and have spent much time thinking about it, it just sounds bad when you say hunting whales. It's almost like we're going to go puppy hunting later. Like, mm, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> it, it collapse some baby seals while we're at it. <laughs> yeah, like, it just sounds bad right well i mean it's you know i think it's important for us to remember that you know before the age of electricity whales were our source of illumination right this this is primarily where we got the oil to fuel lamps you know Mm -hmm. the days preceding electricity so there's just this is kind of global desensitization around whaling yeah and then and and but then you have this these conservation efforts as we begin to look at populations uh, of whales but even today even today uh i was reading uh, just in preparation for this that that over a thousand whales are are still hunted each and every year and we use them in any number of products mostly related to pharmaceuticals um and then, um, and then, you know, whale meat and, and things like that are still uh, still consumed. But today, likely some of the stuff that you have consumed across the last year uh, has had whale product in it. Um, mm. yeah. well, a thousand a year. I mean, that sounds bad, but you know, when you compare that to hundreds a day. Yes. Right. Yeah. That's not yeah. Bad. better. Yeah. yeah, steps in the and right I, direction, I, but we're not there yet. I think that's also why we have the nuclear energy message at the same time, where it's like there's such thing as what we absolutely have to do for our own survival, compared to are, are we just doing this to do it? You know, <laughs> like right, like so. Right. I think it is interesting, like you said. At one point, it was almost necessary for survival for us to hunt whale. but now yeah. it seems like it's just irresponsible to do that. Like, not only are we damaging, you know our ecosystem the whole world's ecosystem we're also not really getting anything out of it that we couldn't get some other way you know like it's like at this point there isn't really a need um and, and i think there is this thing and this is maybe not the best earth day subject but we do have to find some balance in some of these topics so uh, who all seen the good place everybody seen the good place yeah or some of us mm-hmm. do the people who have not seen the good place do y'all care if i spoil something no, uh, I don't care. Okay. At one point in the show, in order to make a point, they go to find the world's best person. He has scored the best on good or bad place points. <laughs> and they were going to go find him. And it turns out he was also still going to go to the bad place, which is a whole other thing. But they went to find him and the stuff that he was doing. That checks out. <laughs> like it was to the extent of like he wouldn't eat most and most plants because some other animal needed to do it. And so if he ate it, he is like, you know, ultimately causing animals harm because he's taking away from them. And he's like only like the only water he drinks is like recycled urine from himself. Like he like to the extent of the most extreme. And it's like still he wasn't good enough. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, he was at a point where he was making himself miserable and he's still not good enough in the eyes of the divine or whatever system is in that show that I don't want to spoil for people. But I think there's a lot of truth there that like, not only is there the Christian message that you can never be good enough on your own, but there's also this point of yeah, to an extent. Yeah. Be there. Let's be responsible. Let's help the planet. But also there is a point where you're taking it so extreme that all you're doing, all you're really accomplishing is making yourself miserable and not getting anywhere for it. So I, I think there's a little bit of balance here. Not to say that it's not important to take care of the planet, but I'm just saying that there does seem to be a point of, okay, but what do we need to survive? Let's not just make ourselves miserable. Let's think about this and not just be extreme one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. And I I think that's a, that's a really good segue to 
uh, what I messaged you about even, um, which, so biblically, um, there's this idea where we were given dominion and that all of creation actually exists for man who is God's final chief awesome good creation um at the same time there is a balance where we are called to steward and to be responsible the things that we're given so uh you know i i would like to open uh the conversation and really just ask you know where do those intersect like how uh you know where how do we believe, you know, we have dominion and that nature exists for our benefit because our creator created a world that could sustain his creation. But we also have to be responsible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll say when it comes to this scenario, it's like, what is a reasonable amount of controlling the world versus controlling the world in our image mm-hmm. and doing whatever pleases? And mm-hmm. I would argue that the whaling industry it got to that point where it didn't matter. Yeah, even if we keep going at the rate we're going, the whales are going to be gone. That's okay because we're still going to make a profit off of it. Mm-hmm. That's when there's a huge moral dilemma. That's when there's a huge issue. There is no issue whatsoever in a sustainable population of killing a whale harvesting what it has you know that's what animals are around here to do because we are omnivores some people try and deny that about themselves some people have actual legitimate medical reasons not to but that's it's part of our life like and now we harvest a deer or a bird or a chicken or what have you mm-hmm. it's like that that is here for our benefit but what do we do with them also defines us mm-hmm. do we have a bunch of chickens like an inch apart from each other, completely in darkness or what have you, uh, just so they can grow enough to be fed to people. Do we uh, continue to allow other countries in the world to go after whales because it's part of their culture or, you know, they're making a profit off of or what have you. Like that's where I have the issue. That's where the dominion becomes in my own image versus I am actually in charge as directed by God. Mm Mm-hmm. So, oh, Justin, did you have something you want to say? Well, I was going to say, so, you know, one of the things um, as we think about uh, that injunction there in Genesis 1 to have um, uh, dominion, you know, some translations uh, talk about mastering the earth. Um, You know, Dr. Ellen Davis, who some of you might be familiar with and, and uh, Old Testament uh, professor or Hebrew Bible professor has said that um, you know the 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 Hebrew word there that we typically translate as dominion or or mastery has uh, the verb has two elements one is skill and one is power and so you know she has recommended uh, translating it you know skilled mastery. Um, which gives, um, which adds a little bit of a texture, I think, uh, yeah. uh, to it, uh, because this idea of of dominion really has been um, used in unhelpful ways. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. if I am to dominate, I can do whatever I want. Uh, I'm not thinking about the the need for anything to last. Um, but this almost artistic view of, of, uh, of, um, working with uh, natural resources might make me, think, well, you know, there's, uh, elements of, of preservation as well as use, not just consuming here. Mm-hmm. So, man, I, I might get a little heretical in here. Sorry, guys. Um, what else? Yeah, is Christians, new? Christians used to it. It's fine. Uh, so I'm well, so surprised. 
a couple of the instances like biblically that I, f- I find interesting is obviously first, I, I think Genesis one was written separately from two and three. Like I just, it doesn't mm-hmm. seem like there's a lot of evidence that they're the same mm-hmm. author. Um, I'm so I, I, f- I find it interesting. Genesis one, it is let's subdue, let's care for, let's, you know, that kind of stuff. But then after the flood, the same command is given to Noah and his children, but instead it's now creation fears you. Now it trembles. Now you're lording over it. Uh, and that, so I think that in, that difference exists for a reason. And then when you look at Genesis 2 and 3, where animals are in harmony, and then as mankind sins, all of a sudden death and killing and hunting and all this stuff enters in. I, mm-hmm. I think there's a direct correlation to the sin of man, the fall of man, the flood, and how the world around us interacts with us. You know, and when we go through the Bible and it talks about salvation, a lot of the times it's not saying personal salvation, human salvation. It's saying the whole world. Um, in Isaiah, it talks about the birth pains of salvation are in the whole planet. So I, I think there's this thing of as we pursue salvation, we're pursuing not only our own health spiritually, but we're pursuing the health of other humans and the health of our planet. And that includes caring for, presiding over, and, and nurturing the planet. Now, does that mean never eat any meat? No, we are omnivores, as Christian pointed out. And uh, one of my favorite, uh, this might be blasphemous to talk about Lil Dicky, but one of my favorite songs by Lil Dicky <laughs> has a song called Pillow Talk. <laughs> and he's uh, he's with this girl who's a vegetarian. And what like I love this line because she's all like grossed out that he's a meat eater. And she's like, ah, and they produce all these animals and they like grow them just for slaughter. And she's like, that's gross. And he's like, Hold up. So if some wolves are out here, do you think they're going to like respectfully not eat you as you leave? Like, no, but that's what wolves do. They attack. I was like, that's what people do. We cultivate and then we eat. <laughs> like, that is the nature of humans. Um, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Now, is there a way to do it in gross, uh, irresponsible, in what I think is just evil ways? Yeah, like I will not eat uh, chicken if it doesn't say cage free on it. Because for me, that's a line where I'm like, if I can afford to do it, and again, this is. A lot of times it's affordability, but if I can afford it, which to these days I usually can, I'm going to get cage-free chicken because I think it's irresponsible and even cruel to do what Chris was talking about, where they're growing chickens so close to each other that their skin is growing around the cages. Like that's, there's something inhumane and, and just, that's not the kind of thing that God called us to when he's talking about nurturing and guiding over animals. That no. is us. Uh, how can we profit? That's gluttony at, to the extreme. Um, both, you know, and how much we need to consume and how much we just want to make profit. And I think that is a certain level of evil that I'm like, ah, and again, I know some people can't afford to eat all cage free or can't afford cage free eggs. And I don't mean to make anyone feel bad, but that is the kind of thing that I think I think about when I'm thinking of what does it mean to responsibly interact with the earth where when I'm not living a sinful life, creation is interacting with me better, not worse. Right. I mean, just one more thing to say about the, this whole idea of uh, of sin and and how it has just dis- it distorts. So one of the things you see immediately in the midst of this judgment, which is telling us how this sin is going to affect us, um, is you start seeing disconnection. So, you know, if, yeah. if salvation, in the Greek at least, is sozo, it's healing. So what's one of the things it heals? Well, it heals our disconnection. And growing sense of disconnection and, you know, no longer seeing, appreciating the circle of life, the cycles of, of really anything, the, the interconnectedness of anything and anyone is part of the, um, the thing that is, damaged and distorted in what we popularly call the fall. And so uh, what this redemptive move uh, that we think about, at least from a New Testament perspective, that's part of the healing. This healing, the ability for us to see the connectedness, not only with one another, but kind of an, an us and all creation. I want to go, what is it? Psalm 36 Six, you know, it's God's come to save mm-hmm. yeah. us and uh, all of creation. Yeah. Mm. Amen. Hallelujah. Th- there's one more note I think we need to hit on this. Going back to the movie, still kind of keeping in line with what we've been talking about here. Um, I, sorry, I got distracted there. 
But anyway, uh, going along with the lines of the movie, there does part of this conversation we have to, I think, touch on the ethics of zoos in general, of conservations, habitats, all this kind of stuff that we create, where we're keeping animals in captive. Um, and the movie does some of this really well, I think. Uh, and again, it's where it's oversimplifying some stuff where you see this dilemma. We have the whales in captivity because they were injured. Now they're about to be pregnant. They need to be let go. But if we let them go, there's going to be whalers that are going to hunt them. Usually it's not this direct. We know this is immediately going to happen when we let them go. But that is the conversation. When you talk to people around like zoos and stuff today, the conversation usually is the research done in zoos and in conservation is done to help the animals that are out in the wild. And also a lot of the times the ones in captivity, if we let them go, don't have the same defenses and stuff that they're going to last very long in the wilderness. And we also know, even though that a lot of the times they're less happy in smaller environments, animals typically live longer when they're being protected as opposed to the wild where we have all this pollution in the water, all these poachers, hunters, etc. The mm -hmm. expectation of life for animals in zoos are way longer than those out in the wild. So we have this conversation of, are the animals as happy as they could be when they're in captivity? No. Are they going to live a little bit longer? Yes. Is it going to help us prolong the life of other animals in the wild? Yes. But is that worth it? Um, and, and that's the big question people have now. Um, let's get Christian's thoughts on this. Christian, go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as someone who in another life would have ended up, ended up being a marine biologist, you know, if I didn't have to take chemistry as a prerequisite and have to do math with my science, you know, that's another thing. <laughs> I, I would have probably been in this field in some way, shape or form, because one of my goals was to study uh, sea snakes and sea crates and take their venom, try and get antivenom for it. Because I believe at this point in time, we still don't have that. That's one useful way we can bring those ca uh, creatures into captivity, look upon them and say, how many people die per year? From being bitten, there is no known cure. There's no antivenom. Well, that's because we don't, we haven't done enough research yet. We haven't found that that one thing that gets us there. And then when it comes to zoos and even things like SeaWorld, yeah, uh, the abuses at SeaWorld never for them, one hundred percent. I think there should have been more room for everything there. That that I am okay with them being in cages. I'm okay with them being in these domes so long as they have the space. They don't get depressed. They don't just end up losing the will to live at a certain point in time because of the educational properties that brings to us. I learned a lot just from that one trip when I was like six or seven going to SeaWorld that inspired more to make me research more that never would have happened had I not been introduced that way. The same thing, I was always a big zoo person growing up. Uh, growing up, uh, with, I would go with my parents and my grandparents and I would name the zoos by color. There was the brown zoo, there was the green zoo. They had actual names, but to me, they're just these, I would associate a color with them and that's where they were. And I learned so much more about these animals that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to do were they not in these caged up environments far away removed from where they're actually supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, are they handled well there? Are they being loved and cared for? Not always. And that's not something I can solve, but it is something we need to be mindful of. There is a price to pay for the knowledge that we gain here. Mm. Yeah, I... um. I'm talking a little bit more about it here in a minute, but at uh, SeaWorld specifically, some of the worst just things that we've done to sweet creatures were done in SeaWorld. But also, uh, if you, I think it was like, if you combine every other program in the world right now, it still doesn't save as much sea life as SeaWorld has saved. <laughs> like like yeah. the amount that they save and manage to help. Uh, I, I don't think we can turn away from that and act like SeaWorld's all evil, but we also can't mm -hmm. act like they're all good. Well, um, right. So it's also to, good to note that there are, we've got various paradigms here, and and this has been an evolving conversation from the, you know, zoos is a kind of menagerie for <clears throat> the aristocratic. Like zoos were the first worldwide web, right? So you know you're bringing all these things from across the world to a place so the people, mostly the elite, can view it and learn from it, not in a um, not in a healthy way. And then, you know, zoos today, I mean, they're just very, various different kinds. Like the zoo that is closest to me, I've actually appreciated in some ways because 
Um, they create these natural habitats, uh, mostly mm -hmm. for African and North American uh, animals. And the, the uh, so natural habitats where they try to put vegetation that approximates the vegetation of, you know, where these animals come mm -hmm. from. And so like the, the, one of the areas in the, in the uh, African uh, animal habitat is, larger than most zoos, you know, in, in our country. So, so they're, they're, it's not perfect, but then they, I think there are different ways you can do it and conceive of it that are more humane uh, toward uh, these creatures. But still the bottom line today is we are creating the conditions globally where it's hard to sustain the life of some of these Creatures. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it goes from this menagerie that uh, is just really unhealthy and, and unhelpful and, you know, the practices of sea mm -hmm. world and such to, oh my gosh, we, we might need some of these places so that we can avoid extinction for some species. Yeah. Um, Chris and I both started college wanting to do marine biology at UNCW. Cool. Uh, I still visit Wilmington a lot. I love the city. I think it's a beautiful place to Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and they have a, a sea turtle conservation there that or, or near there. I might not be in there. I'm trying to remember exactly where it's at. Y'all don't quote me. Just know there's a sea turtle thing near that. There's somewhere on the coast of North Carolina, you know. Um, but one of there's the things I like about the aquarium there, I think. I'm not thinking about the aquarium. You know, this might be at, um, what's, what's the island near there that, that nice people had beef beach houses at surf surf city somewhere <laughs> around there it was anyway. like bald head island was I don't know. conservatory I don't know, guys anyway sea turtle conservation Point one of the things i found really interesting when i visited is a they had to let people visit because otherwise they couldn't gain enough funds to continue doing what they're doing so they need people who can come and watch and enjoy the turtles so that they get the money to keep doing what they're doing what are they doing they're rescuing turtles who've mistaken plastic bags or whatever nearby in the ocean as jellyfish or whatever who get stuck they get suffocated whatever and they get brought back in one of the things i thought most telling that that really speaks to this conversation for me is they were talking about there was a few turtles who they've had more than once so they let them go because they got healthy whatever and then they come back the next year find another plastic bag and here they are and it's almost like man if we would have just kept the turtle it wouldn't have had to go through that again <laughs> Um, and I understand why we don't, but that, you know, that's part of this conversation when we're thinking about aquariums and zoos is we've created terrible environments in the wild for these mm -hmm. creatures. And, and I do feel like we have some obligation to do something about that. Zoos, aquariums is one answer. Is it a perfect answer? No. Are there a better answers? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what they are. If there are, uh, Matt, did you have any other thoughts when it comes to, to this kind of stuff where I, I got one last topic with this? I want to jump into. I'm not, I'm uh, not really. I mean, those are good, you know, those are good questions. Um, you know, cause the fact of the matter is the world that we have created a lot of the times these animals are better off in captivity. Um, because they just won't survive in, uh, you know, with what we've done to their environment. Um, but also, um, no, you know, I, I think we've said all the things. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm going to give one practical thing and we can, we can move on from this topic then. Um, because at, I, I am at risk currently of being hypocritical because I constantly talk about how I hate utilitarian arguments of the ends justify the means. And we're doing this terrible thing because in the end, that's better. Here's the thing. When we plan out our actions and we consider what is the best action. We're not just thinking of the end outcome. We're thinking of like currently what's the best action to take when you do something where you just take it. Well, if we keep the turtle, it's less likely to go through this again, then you could slowly justify more and more stuff, right? If we do this research and we collect the sperm, then that's going to help us provide for future generations. And if we do this, this education is more valuable for humans. And before you know it, you're doing some of the terrible things that happened in SeaWorld. Here's how we stop stuff like that. 
we create systems ahead of time where we say, here are the lines. Here's what we think is okay and what's necessary to preserve life. And here's what's not okay. Um, and, and here's where I maybe upset some people. Uh, that Black Fin documentary, if you go online, you could see there's just a document of how many things it said that was just directly false. And it's absurd amount. Like the amount of things that it said was just wrong information or just lies. It should be a crime. Maybe it is a crime for it to be out there. <laughs> like... But at the same time, if you go through one of those other documentaries that talk about why Blackfin is wrong, they embellish the other side. Like, that's just what it does. Uh, so, like, uh, one example I'm thinking of is in the Blackfin documentary, they show where orcas at SeaWorld have that curve of fin on top. And they're saying that's because they don't get to move enough and they're sad and they're depressed and this is evil. But then if you actually talk to a biologist who studies orcas for any period of time, that whales in the wild get that a lot where it curves on top. That's actually rather frequent thing that happens and a lot of orcas simply just decide to stay close to a certain bay or something and they don't actually move that far out because they have plenty of food where they're at and when that happens that's when their torpal fin curves over so actually if they're being provided for taken care of well and they're in a small environment like that that's just what would happen mm. like that's not some evil thing that blackfin made it out to be that's just biology just what it is so you gotta learn about these things and People like us and theologians and Bible people usually aren't the best equipped to talk about this. So here's who should be talking about it. Who should be making the standards are other biologists. So there's what's called the AZA accreditation. Um, and I personally, I make it a point and hey, since all you're doing is deciding not to do something, everyone can afford to do this. Just simply don't go to zoos or petting zoos or any of those things that are not AZA accredited. Because if they're not, there's a reason they're not. And if they are, they're making more money for being AZA accredited. So they have the incentive to be accredited. There's no incentive not to be accredited other than you're doing some stuff that wouldn't let you be. And I even got to say, Disney's, uh, Disney's Animal Kingdom at one point lost accreditation. And I had to avoid Animal Kingdom until it got accreditation back. Because there's a reason that it lost that. Right? Uh, right now, SeaWorld actually is AZA accredited. So is Animal Kingdom. And I think this is an important thing because we know when you see that, that there are people who are outside that are not making money from Disney or from SeaWorld who are observing what's happening and saying, this is responsible, ethically taking care of the animals, providing information for others that is useful and helping our planet. So that's where I think um, zoos and aquariums that are AZA accredited to me are an overall good. I can see the argument for it not. Do I think it's better for animals not to be in captivity? If we had a good world for them to be in, sure. <laughs> I don't think I would love the idea of them all being captives. But it seems like it might be the, the less of two evils at the time. All right. Any other thoughts from anybody? Thank you guys for letting me go on my AZA rant. <laughs> I realize I've done this before on the show and I apologize. So back to the movie. If we're rating this 0 to 10... What are you? Where are you guys putting the the whale apocalypse film? <laughs> um, I'll set the standard. This movie is a ten out of ten. You yes! can't go wrong. <laughs> I adore this film. Like, is it my favorite Star Trek movie? No, there's actually two. I would even give ten out of ten, 10 out of tens before this. That'd be Wrath of Khan and First Contact. Um. But this would probably be my third favorite on that list. And that's a very great list to be on, on yeah. these even numbered Star Trek films that are good. And <laughs> it's got what you need. It's got good characters. It's got good humor. It's got a goofy setting and premise that should never work without everything this has working together for it. Leonard Nimoy did extremely, tremendously great oh, yeah. work as a director oh, yeah. to make this stupid idea sound <laughs> intelligent. Beautiful. Beautiful. Justin, how, follow that up. What do you, how do you rate Star Trek, the voyage home? You know, I, I, I want to give it a, a 10 out of 10 as well. I really uh, very strongly agree with Christian's list of, of uh, the movies there. It, it, it is a movie where, um, you feel like you've settled into a wonderful groove with each of these characters, uh, with what this movie is trying to do. One of the one of the things that we haven't talked about that I've read in blogs, other places, is how much this is a great movie about a healthy allyship. 
uh, because uh, rather than them saying in the 23rd century, hey, let's just figure out a way to replicate sound and see what it does. They actually went and got the voices uh, that could actually speak um, authentically. And Mm. so just for... So, yeah, it's kind of a cool, cool uh, yeah, idea like there, that. right? And and so um, I think in so many ways, it's just a good movie and one where I got to love this family that's on this ship uh, in in so many ways and have fun with them. Man, yeah, y'all be looking forward to. Uh, we're going to do another review of this film, but it's just going to be us talking about uh, how Christians can learn from Star Trek Four. Uh, when we're speaking to the other, how to speak their language. <laughs> there we go. Uh, Matt, if you had to review this film, zero to 10, where are you, where are you putting it? Oh, gosh. Um, you know, if if I'm to allow myself to wear the nostalgia goggles, <laughs> then, absolutely, uh, you know, then absolutely 10 out of 10. But, um, you know... <laughs> I'm I'm at a point right now where things like plot and good writing and things like that matter. Um, so for fun and entertainment, it is a ten. But for <laughs> for plot and writing, I don't even know that I can I can score this thing. <laughs> I just I just want to give I want to I want to so rate. That- Matthew's review right there for a moment. I mean, with all the drama that went into, I'm at a point in my life with things like <laughs> plot matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Oh, man. You know, so, so if, if it's at like a two for plot and writing and a 10 for entertainment, I got to give it like a seven. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. fair. All right. Uh, I'm going to be pretty close to Matt on this, actually. Um, (laughs) If I'm, mind you, this is the first Star Trek I ever remember seeing. I loved this Mm -hmm. as a kid. This Mm -hmm. was like, this is beautiful. It's like I talked before about how, like, I haven't seen a lot of Star Trek until recently. This is something I've been watching my whole life. So this movie is one of the exceptions to that rule. (laughs) Um, Man, it's so hard. If uh, Here's how I'm going to do it. If I'm rating the parts that happen in the 23rd century, that part's getting like a four out of 10, maybe a five. Like it was just the, the plot and everything was all over the place. It was just nonsense of, Hey, we want them in the 1980s. How do we get them there? Right. <laughs> but if we're talking about the bulk of the film, like all, but like 20 minutes happens in the 1980s, that part alone, that's a 10 out of 10. That's a beautiful, like from start to finish, everything's coherent. It makes sense. The acting's well done. The cinematography's fun. The jokes are great. They all landed well, even, you know, all this time later for me. So as a whole, you know, again, the the beginning and end, the 23rd century part, uh, it's probably close to a four. But we're talking about the 80s. I'm giving that a 10. So at the end, I'm going to give it about an eight out of 10 because most of it Mm -hmm. happened in the part that I liked. (laughs) So (laughs) Yeah. 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 That's where I'm at with this one. (laughs) All right. Anybody have any any final thoughts on Star Trek: The Voyage Home? Does it stand the test of time? Do you have any like favorite characters or scenes you want to uplift before we move on? I just want to say that just related to Star Trek, it does a good job in living into this idealism related to the future. Um, that is such a Gene Roddenberry thing, right? And so, as far as you know, reaching down and, and, and connecting to that, you know, what's we think of as like pure and good about Star Trek. I think it touched on that well. Mm. Yeah, I also, this is going to get to another thing we recorded recently that's not out yet that Christian probably not going to like that I'm referencing. But uh, he won't. Uh, our listeners might not even know what I'm referencing. It's fine. I feel like this movie was the deconstructionist movie for Star Trek. Because you see when they go in the 1980s, there's all these moments of the stuff that they take for granted or that's good about Star Trek that the movie kind of makes jokes about, right? Like of like how Spock is and how he's just so not human and how he just stands out. They kind of just poking jokes at Spock throughout it, but in a loving way, it feels like. Like it's not like in a mean kind of way, but it's lovingly throughout. You know, Scotty is just like, "Mm, let's just give him this invisible aluminum so I get what I want and (laughs) 
you know, like, like and, and you you see throughout the film, like they're, they're joking on the Russian, they're pe- they're just picking jokes here and there, even Kirk's, you know, womanizing thing, but it's all done in a loving way that at the end you appreciate the characters more. So that's something where I feel like it was a bit of a deconstructionist movie, but really in a, in a positive, fun kind of way. Hmm. All right. Any other thoughts on Star Trek, the voyage home? Nah, just that if no one has seen it, they should. It's a fun movie. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'll say I don't know how I feel about the deconstructionist idea for the movie. I'd have to give him more thought on that. I'm going to go with my go default and say you're wrong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. And I'll get back to you. Um, then maybe we will even record that conversation. But uh, for characters, yeah, everyone has a chance to shine in this film, like we talked before. Mm-hmm. Um, perfect moments for everyone that the the other other than the main three they get their chances sulu gets to pilot the helicopter at the big moment there to save them uh with the supplies and you have uhura and chekov going on a stealth mission together to get the nuclear energy and of course like for me to stand out character was bones Ooh. him reacting to the bloody dark ages in this film of medicine <laughs> and you know, normally in a Star Trek movie, there would be that, like, we can't affect the past. You can't do this. And it's kind of like that moment that Will and I talked about when we had the JLA Avengers <laughs> that crossover, where Batman tells everyone not to interfere with the Marvel Universe, but then he sees the Punisher about to kill some drug dealers. And who's the first person to break the rules? It's Batman. Who's the first person to break the rules to not interfere with the, the, fu- the present? It's Bones. He sees this woman on dialysis, decries the fact that this is a thing in this time and place, and he helps her. Yeah. That is, it's a smaller moment, but it's such a powerful character moment for oh, yeah. him. Yeah. And I love it. Yeah. Another, another good Bones moment. Uh, early on, I liked to, uh, because for those who don't know, the third movie, Bones was basically possessed by Spock. It was a thing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's just how the movie contact. treats it. They're like, I don't worry about that. It happened. But there, there was a point where Bones is really trying to connect with Spock. It's Spock's being like super Vulcan and just not wanting to connect. And he asks about um, about death. And, and you know mm-hmm. given my accident and stuff it was one of those things where like that kind of conversation it's like mm-hmm. somewhat triggering for me because how often someone's like oh did you see something or oh did it and listen guys i'm not i don't hate anybody who's asked me this stuff it's just you hear it repeated so much you're like man okay all right guys mm-hmm. <laughs> but he asked Spock, and Spock's yeah. like uh, i couldn't quite describe it to you until you've experienced it <laughs> and i was like i love that i love that moment where Spock's like go die and then i'll t- we can talk about it. <laughs> 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 well, it was just good times. <laughs> oh man! Well, I think All right, too, it, it kind of accidentally foreshadows that something. Can be that, is, that is one of one, yeah, one of the <laughs> few good parts of Star Trek Five, where Bones oh. deals with the death of his dad. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mm. You know, I, I know they probably never intended it to be that way, but it, if you just look at it like that, it feels like it was foreshadowed. Mm-hmm. Also, kind of let you know, I've been like because I haven't really been part of the Trek community because I've only seen the original movies. I've been really nervous to talk about the original movies with other Trek fans. Cause I'm like, man, what if like I go into this thinking I love Star Trek four. And then Christian's like, this is the last Jedi of Star Trek. This is garbage. <laughs> you know, like, I'm, I'm, I, was, I was a little bit nervous going in. Like, what's he going to say no, about this? No, no. Film? <laughs> I don't think there's oh. anything in Star Trek that has fallen to those pits of despair. How, how do people feel about Star Trek six? This is my final question. Do people is typically six? like it? Hate it? <laughs> I enjoy six. Yeah. I, I mean, find, I find it movie. entertaining and amusing. Uh, like, it's a it makes good me movie. laugh. Uh, you know, it's very much a, uh, uh, just like this one, very much a product of its time. You know, it is, mm-hmm. it is obviously like Cold War commentary. Yeah. Like, yeah. not even veiled. They're not even hiding it. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's good. I like. Uh, you know, like subterfuge, uh, subterfuge is always good, mm-hmm. and um, you know when there's spies and all that, that's always good. Um, and I don't know. I, I think j- just <laughs> yeah, the character development that happens in that movie. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's another movie where there's kind of a just eh, you know cliche uh, this is this is cold war commentary um plot line but it's written in a way through the characters that uh, that elevates it to be far more than that 
Mm. Yeah, I I think. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to just randomly start reviewing another movie. I just was curious what everyone's <laughs> thoughts were. I, I remember like growing up having only watched Star Trek one through six. I always felt like there was supposed to be another one. Like it was like that just didn't feel like that was the mm. last one. That was the only thing that I had with it where I was like, this doesn't feel final. But that's all. Well, if everybody else is good, we can uh, we can go ahead and go to our, our wrap up. Is everybody good? Mm-hmm. All right. So then let's the find everybody. <laughs> As we're wrapping this one up, let's go ahead and ask everybody for a recommendation. Um, doesn't have to be Star Trek related or anything like that. Just uh, anything, anything you think people deserve to check out. I'll start first. Everyone should check out Fallout. Uh, it's kind of bugging me that it's not getting the same hype as um, uh, the, the last one standing because mm. I think it's better personally. It's really good. It's good TV. People need to watch it. All right, Christian, you got a recommendation for everybody. Yeah, uh, if you need some more cetacean action in your life, uh, then I suggest uh, going to After War Gundam X, where you will hear the words Dolphin New Type. And that's all I'm going to say. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I just the amount of sci fi that's like, hey, space, you know what it needs? Whales, space whales like Star Wars, Star Trek, uh, Treasure Planet, uh, <laughs> like pretty much any any sci fi I could think of at some point decided. There's got to be whales in space, right? <laughs> uh, Justin, what are you have a recommendation for everybody? Well, you know, I've already said it, and I know everybody's already watching it except for you, but X-Men 97 is mm-hmm. so good. <laughs> and this was my favorite comic strip growing up. Professor X is my favorite superhero. Oh, uh, hey. He's the Malcolm X of the comic book world, right? So, um, uh I uh, I'm I'm loving it, uh, even though it has less Professor X than I'd like, but not yeah. completely absent. You you will and Christian need to need to hop on and talk about that. I think. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I'm it fine sounds with like, that. Sounds like one in the works. All right, Matt, you have any recommendations for everybody out there? Um, sure. I mean, I'm probably the only person in existence that hadn't seen it yet, but um, you know. For um, you know, getting ready to record um, the other one, I've been uh, catching up on a lot of Star Wars stuff, and um, love love Clone Wars. I just uh, hmm. I yeah, avoided fair. it. Uh, um, I you know always avoided it for whatever reason. I don't know if it was animated or whatever. So it's just like eh. But uh, if you if you haven't seen Clone Wars. It, it, and you're the kind of person that likes to know like the in-between stuff, watch Clone Wars. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I... yeah seconded. Yeah. Also, bold move to recommend Star Wars on a Star Trek episode. <laughs> I love it. I love it, though. No, I actually, but right before we started Systematic Geekology as a show, I watched all of Clone Wars. Um, mm-hmm. And it's because TJ has bothered mm-hmm. me for most of our friendship because I kept saying that Revenge of the Sith was just a bad movie. I still think it's a bad movie. It's one of my least favorites. It's no longer my least favorite, probably really? because of Clone Wars and also because Nine was just so bad. But but he um he made me watch yeah, he made me watch uh Clone Wars to make it better. And he was like, It'll make it better. And I'm like, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. It can't be made better. I was wrong. It was made better. Still not a good movie, but it was better after Clone Wars. So yeah, I gotta <laughs> I gotta also recommend that one. That's a good one. All right, guys. Well, again, thank you, everybody, for listening. We wish you a happy Earth Day. Or if you're listening to this after Earth Day, we hope you had a happy Earth Day and that you're doing stuff like uh, visiting AZA accredited zoos to make the planet better. Um, Hey, be sure if you're on Apple Podcasts to rate and review. If you're on Spotify, hit the five stars and the little notification bell. And if you're on your laptop, go over to podchaser.com. Leave us a rate and review over there because that helps the algorithm find us. Also, if you're on YouTube, smash that like and subscribe button because if you don't, you're smashing Will's heart, and no one wants to do that. So just smash that like button. It's worth it, I promise. <laughs> and hey, guys, again, big thanks to Trip Fuller for sponsoring the show. You rock, man. And we ask everybody to do one, well, yeah, one very important thing. And that's for me to remember the outro music. Wait, here we go. Here we go, guys. Just wait. Wait. No, okay. We ask everybody to <laughs> remember one very important thing. And that is that we are all a chosen people, a geekdom, a priest. As Christian face palms, face palming us out. <laughs> God help us. <laughs> <laughs>